On today's show, we deep dive into jetpacks, Tesla's autopilot limitations, and a Japanese actress who just happens to be a robot. And we also talked to author David Goodman about his new book, The Autobiography of James T. Kirk, only one of the greatest Starfleet captains of all time. And also, Jeff and I take a trip down to BlizzCon 2015 to check out the esports scene. Get ready, guys! It's our new set! It's Tomorrow Daily! Woo! Citizens of the internet, welcome to Tomorrow Daily, the best geek talk show in the known universe. It's actually a talk show this time. <laughs> it's not <laughs> so just a one person talking at the camera show. Yeah, yeah, one person talking in a show uh, by themselves. There's two people here. Uh, I'm Ashley Scala. Joining me for the first time in our launch show format, Jeff Kanata. I am so excited to be here, Ashley. This is awesome. It's been fun doing the, the small shows uh, during the week, but... Yeah. Being here, hanging out with you, we get to talk about stuff, deep dive into stuff. It's going to be good. Yeah, yeah. So basically, uh, if you have not been watching, if this is your first time checking out Tomorrow Daily, welcome to the show. And secondly, uh, if this is, you know, you're coming back after a while, we have a new thing now. So Monday through Wednesday, Jeff and I each host a short version of the show. Uh, we kind of hand off the short versions, and that's kind of like homework for the Thursday show. <laughs> that's I'm going to call it homework, but it's fun homework. Yeah, it's uh, it's homework if, if without the work. It's just, yeah. it's home play. Yeah, home play. There home play. Go. It's home play, and then you're going to, and then you can come join us on Thursdays where we deep dive into our three favorite stories of the week, and we're going to talk a little bit more about what they mean, and why we like them, and what's so interesting about them uh, beyond just the news itself, which is all we can get to during the short shows. Plus, we're going to have guests, we're going to have fun other stuff going on. Challenges. It's yeah, it's a much longer, cooler show, and uh, so I, I would think that it'll be a good complement to each other, the, the bite-sized stuff and then the full meal. Yes, and can we just take a quick second to appreciate our brand new set, which I have to say uh, it, it was an extremely amazing job done by the team at CBS.com uh, and also uh, some other crews here inside the building. Um, this set went up in about a month. Yeah. And uh, it is amazing. All of the panels in the back are actually, they can be changed. The color can be changed them at any given time. Unfortunately, we don't have anybody running the lighting board because producer Logan is in the control room. Uh, so, but it can change. And then uh, we also have our robot friends joining us on the show. Think of it as our studio audience. Yeah. Uh, we got Genghis, of course. Genghis always here. We have the portal ha, gun hanging ha, out. Ha, ha, applause, <laughs> sign. Ha, ha. <laughs> uh, and then we have uh, Wally. We got a MIP robot. We have a Sony Poochie over there. Which is old school, and then we also have Eva from Wally, -E, um, and then of course BB-8. Uh, I, I need to get an R2D2. I think they should all these things should rotate in and out. I think it should be no, a we should, living, no, of course. breathing robot we'll habitat. Be changing, uh, we can change this to whatever <laughs> we want. We got a portal gun back here; it's not necessarily a robot. So, um, so yeah, right. great stuff, and we're really excited about this, and we hope you like it. Uh, and ho and and if you don't have time to listen to the long show. You listen to short shows during the week, but if you have time, now you can listen to this yeah. this week. Yeah, and if you want to see your robot on our show, send it to us. Send it to us. <laughs> we need to get a P.O. box for that. All right, guys, let's hit the headlines. <laughs> Obviously, number one story of the week for me is jetpacks. Well, anytime we can talk about jetpacks is a good time, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, and uh, this is good jetpacks. Yeah, I've seen jetpacks before, uh, and most of the time when you see a jetpack, it's the size of a small car. Yeah. And uh, very loud and noisy and very impractical. And it's not the jetpack dream that we've all had, which no. is easy and compact and Rocketeer-like. Yeah, and Rocketeer-like. And that's, for me, why I was so excited to see the JB-9 from Jetpack Aviation. So here it is. You're, you're looking at it. That is the inventor and CEO, David Maiman. He's taking a spin. Fighting crime. I think he's fighting crime. Is, what he, is that what he's doing? Uh, I, I like to think that that <laughs> is probably what he went and did later that night in, uh, in New York City, in Manhattan, in Gotham, if you will. I think that's probably what needs to happen. He's just patrolling the city for supervillains right now, but none of the supervillains have his awesome jetpack tech <laughs> yeah, yet. And no one's coming to attack the Statue of Liberty, fortunately. So he flew around the Statue of Liberty. That thing looks really agile. So rad. Look at how amazing. That's amazing. That yeah. is amazing. That is the dream, guys. That is the jetpack dream. I, I, I love the fact that I'm hearing about this uh, on our show and, and our audience is hearing about it on our show, but I kind of wish I heard about it by just being in New York and seeing him fly and around. Just being like, there's a man! In the <laughs> Look, up in the sky! No, it's, it's a, a bird. bird! It's a plane! It's a plane. <laughs> yeah. No, it's a dude in a jetpack. Amazing! <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so let's discuss the JB-9 because I think this is worth some discussion. Uh, he says that they flew this thing very conservatively. Okay. So uh, it, they can un unleash this thing to go about 160 miles an hour. How much do we have to pay him to unleash it? Uh, unleash I, it. He says he won't because Please he's like, I'm, not, I'm too scared to do it. But he, he said you could. 
Theoretically, you can totally open it up. There's somebody that'll do it. Oh, I'm sure. Like let's get me. that. Let's get that Felix Baumgartner guy who jumped out of the who jumped yeah. from space. Like let's, let's do get it. That guy. That guy's nuts. He would totally do it. I bet Red Bull could pay him a lot of money to do it. So I, I uh, think I would do it. The, the flight time's about ten minutes depending on the weight of the pilot. That's not a lot of time to fight crime in. No, that's a very quick crime fighting <laughs> flight. Uh, and then, um, to me, the interesting thing is they're already working on the JB-10. And the JB-10, they said, can go over 200 miles an hour. Right, because nobody will go as fast as this one will go, so let's make a faster one. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, <laughs> hey, let's make it quicker. Uh, and, and also, this is my favorite, total favorite part of the story. He says that someday he wants to he, okay so he doesn't want the jetpack to end up in the wrong hands and he means that from a safety perspective he means that from a super villain perspective let's be honest <laughs> no no i promise safety <laughs> yeah safety safety from super villains i'm assuming that's correct um so he so he says i don't want it to get into consumers hands too soon because uh, this is a direct quote which is my favorite he's like um I'd want to feel like we have an infrastructure to train them. We could technically just send them the unit in a box and say good luck. But a it's jetpack core. Jetpack. I know. I know. I want to be part of the jetpack core. <laughs> he said, but it's not necessarily going to end well if you're doing 200 kilometers an hour, five feet off the ground. You know, like if you have no idea what you're doing. Like, right. Yeah. We that be is a, not going to end well. We have to be a trained super soldier program. Yeah. Of jetpack core. So that we should call it the Rocketeer University. That's I'm what I. I'm just ready. Saying. I'm ready. Sign me up. Please sign me up. My favorite thing about this, you told me about it, uh, that the, it's actually powered by kerosene. Yeah. Which the, seems a little steampunk to me. It, okay, so they actually are calling this, Jetpack Aviation is calling this the, the a true jetpack. And the reason why is because it uses turbine engines as... That's what powers it. And right. so there are competitors like the Martin Jetpack. This is, that's the enormous one. That's the really big one. Yeah. Um, and the Martin Jetpack uses a piston engine. So it drives a bunch of fans. So it's not really like a true jet pack. Right. It's a fan um, pack. Fanny, it's, kind, it's a fanny pack. It's a fanny pack. Yeah, it's really, it's a <laughs> fanny pack. And also it's huge. And, and this particular jetpack, the JB9, is able, he said, you can store it in the backseat of a car. You strap it on. It's a bad. It's an right, actual backpack. You want to drive to your jetpacking location. No, no, no. You don't want to do that because that's that. You're that's defeating the purpose. the purpose. Yeah, you're completely defeating the purpose. But he says, uh, and then also the guys in Dubai who do the jetpack flying. Have you ever seen those videos? No, but I'm going to be searching for them as soon as I get home. Yeah, they're amazing. So these guys who fly over Dubai, which we've seen on the show before, um, actually use uh, they use turbines, but they don't use them for hovering. They actually just use them for thrust. So they have wings that they use almost right. like they look like flying squirrels yeah. to fly around and stuff, but they use j uh, turbines just for thrust to go forward, not not hover. But this guy can can fly. He can hover. He can, I mean, he did a little pirouette in front of the Empire State Building. Or the Empire State Building. The when can Statue I buy Liberty. this? Uh, he says not yet. He, uh, but the Martin jetpack is going to go on sale next year for one hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Oh, I got to start saving. So I got to start, start saving for that. Putting away that cash. That's a lot. That's he a does lot, more than I anticipated. He does say these two things uh, before we move on to the next thing. He says someday they want to get to a point where uh, you're going to be able to put on the pack, press a green button, and immediately hover, suspended hover. Oh, for naps. I just want to hover and hover take a and nap. nap. Just like, amazing. how comforting ten would that be? You only get a 10 minute nap. I can do that. It's and a power then, nap. Uh, and then he says he also wants to put together jetpack races. I, I know. That's that's the face everyone's making right now. So, Come on. I would. Jetpack races? Forget horse racing. Let's just get rid of that. <laughs> it's, the, it. it's literally that. the luge of the sky. I know. So I think <laughs> ABC should really pick up on this and we should have battle bots paired up with jetpack uh, racing. Yeah. In the summer programming schedule. The only problem is the massive death count that jetpack racing is undoubtedly going to yield. Listen, <laughs> they know the risks. That's all I'm saying. Uh, uh, I have another story for okay. you. Um, there is uh, one of my favorite things. I'm ready for this. As much as I'm ready for jetpacks, I am ready for self-driving cars. Everyone in LA is ready for a self-driving car. I, I, I don't understand people <laughs> that say, no, I don't want a self-driving car. Give it to me. I'm ready. One of my really close friends is leasing a Tesla. Oh, jealous. And he has the autopilot feature. He showed it to me. Hey, it's Tesla's amazing. I'm ready for this. Uh, this is amazing. Updates, yeah. But just like everything else on the internet, the autopilot feature is getting ruined by people on YouTube. Maybe <laughs> abusing the privilege of having autopilot. Yeah, it turns out that uh, Tesla's going to have to do some some sort of management of this because people are posting videos of themselves doing some really reckless things. I saw a very interesting video. It's this one right here. Uh, this is Estonian Anonymous, which I'm assuming is a cousin of Kale's. <laughs> Kale, Kale Anonymous <laughs> and Estonian Anonymous. Uh, this guy from... 
the Netherlands, um, he, he, he climbed into his back seat and let his Tesla drive him around. I kind of love this. Seems like a really bad idea. But I don't like the fact that it's on YouTube. for. Uh, he's ruining it for all, the, all yep. of us. Don't, don't publish this on YouTube. Because now Tesla's like, hey, we're going to limit this. But it's awesome. Like, that's what I want. I want to be able to just hang out in just the back let it seat drive you? and lay oh. down. You, you'd be, you wouldn't be able to do this? Okay. I feel like this is the first major move forward in technology that is that scares me as an as an old person. Like, <laughs> like that's a crazy thing to say. Yeah, it's but out like, of your comfort zone. It's out of my comfort zone. Yeah. So, so this is the first bit of technology where I'm like, I would genuinely be terrified. Maybe because I'm a control freak. That's probably why. Yeah, I'd be terrified to give up control of my car because. Car culture is so big in LA. Like I, yeah. I live in my car. I mean, like. But you know it, what's better than, at driving cars than you? Computers. Robots. Yes. Yeah, totally. And and so I get the value of it, but I'm, I'm really scared of the idea. Like it's gonna take some getting used to to like give up control in a car and be like, okay, uh, okay, Siri, take me home. And Siri's like, I got you, and like takes me. I'm home. convinced that our kids' generation and their kids' generation are going to be mystified that we ever let humans drive like, cars. Oh, why do we let They're people gonna be like, drive these wow, things? Wow, people drove those? Did, did anybody die? Oh, yeah, lots of people died lots. all the time. How It's going to be like Horrifying. when we hear about leeching in the Middle Ages or something. It's going to feel insane. And I think we, ju we just need to... G cars are the fourth biggest killer of humans. Yeah. The, if somebody came to you and said, I have the solution for the fourth biggest killer of humans, you'd go, let's do it. Sign yeah, or the fifth. Like if they said, hey, listen, uh, we figured out heart disease. Yeah. It involves dropping a little robot to clean up your arteries. All you got to do is, yes. is release a little control in your life. Yeah. See, that's hard for people. They don't uh, like that. And it, I think it's tough for some people who have I mean, who have driven cars their whole lives. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a lifer in the commuter sense. Like, I mean, I've always driven. Yeah. And so for me, it's it's scary. It's really scary. I, what do you me, think they're going to do to like curb this though? Well, like, that's how the problem is now that now that it's on YouTube, they want to stop. I don't think they should stop it. I think this is what we want to get to. I want to be able to box. take a nap. But I think that's probably going to have some sort of requirement that you have to stay in the seat. You probably have to keep your hands on the wheel. Yeah. There's some lane assist stuff that disengages when you let go. I think BMW does it. Yeah. And but that's a bummer to me because I think I think what we really need to have more controls on is uh, YouTube. Because yes. YouTube is what's ruining it for everybody. Just it's take not, a quiz. It's Just not the autopilot that's the problem. It's the jackass who's putting it on the web. Yeah. Don't just they, there should be an auto an autonomous robot in YouTube's algorithms you that go. refuses to let you upload Tesla autopilot videos. Yes. Just don't tell Elon Musk, guys. Yeah. It's like don't tell your mom. Like yeah, you ruin it. This just, is the kid who's shh. like, oh, we told we partied last night until 3 a.m. You're like, shut up. Shut up, you're ruining it for everybody. Everybody's having a good time right now. Everybody's making it work. But there are some there have been some close calls though. Like people went, oh gosh, like and having it recorrect. Right. But they're using it wrong. They're using it too fast. The the system can't correct in time. I th I would guarantee you that there's going to be more problems from the people overcorrecting than it well, is no, from like the, the computers. The te the uh, that's why they said we're going to limit this because people have been letting them drive uh, hands free at like 90 miles an hour. Yeah. And then when it hits a curb, it, it hits a curve and it goes the wrong way, <laughs> or it starts going into oncoming traffic, like not good. My, so minor details. Minor we're going to start. Listen, mark my words, friends. We're going to start seeing some very serious accidents with Teslas unless people start being responsible. Uh, sign me up. I'm ready. Like, I'm ready. You ready to be irresponsible? I'm ready to be uh, as irresponsible. I'm just pushing myself into the future, one irresponsibility at a time. Fair enough. All right, I like that. We should have a t-shirt that says that. <laughs> pushing ourselves into the future, one irresponsibility at a time. Uh, let's talk about Gemini Def. Okay. Robot actress. This is pretty exciting stuff. I, I find this super fascinating. Uh, Geminoid F is a robot that was built by Hiroshi Ishiguro, who's a roboticist in Japan. I'm sure you've seen this guy on like Discovery Channel, Science Channel. He's the guy who built the robot. He's older Japanese guy. Looks, yeah. And the robot looks just like him. Yeah, it's a little disturbing that you would build a, a, a mini me. A yeah. a, a oh, it's selfie. not even a mini. Yeah, it's, it's a full a, size. Yeah, yeah, it's full size me. A robot yeah. me. Uh, so he also made Geminoid F. And so Geminoid F is in this movie. Here's the This is the trailer for it from Phantom Film called Sayonara. It <laughs> premiered at the Tokyo Film Festival. And the story is, like, really sad. It's about a radiation-plagued uh, Japan, and everyone has to leave Japan. They all have to leave and go to other countries. And so everybody in the country gets a number that assigns them a priority level. And so this woman who the robot acts opposite of uh, is is stuck in her very rural countryside uh, location 
huh. waiting for her number to come up, and she's getting sicker and sicker. The radiation sickness basically is like making her very sick. Huh. So uh, still, still more compelling than Nicolas Cage, this robot. But actor. not as compelling as <laughs> I, I know. I was gonna say slightly more, slightly more emotional than Kristen Stewart. Has, has the robot been on camera? I haven't been able to pick out the robot. Well, that she was there. Yeah. Uh, it's she acts as her like I guess her lifelong kind of caregiver. Huh. Uh, and so uh, Leona is the robot. Same there, is that she her? is right oh, there. Okay. Yeah, that's her. And uh, and so she is. That's the chip. That's yeah, her right acting. there. That's her acting. And apparently she is supposed to be her caretaker for like a robotic caretaker who is built, you know, in a wheelchair. Mm. And she because the robot can't walk. So they uh, had to think of a story device to like put her. They really her, wanted this robot in the movie. I guess so. And but it's really interesting to me that on the website they treat her like she's a real actress, but like she's born in 2010 or like 2012 <laughs> or something like that. I thought that was really funny. Huh. And uh, she got a whole bio up on the Phantom Film website. First they come for our assembly line jobs. Then they come for our actors. Then they come for our acting gigs. Some people, I think, would probably prefer it was the other way around. <laughs> um, how do you feel about this? I, you know, I like that she is a robot playing a robot. Like, I think if she was actually <laughs> a robot meant to be a person, like, oh, right. it's my friend. That's that would not be believable. weird. Like, that would be kind of weird. That friend is so stiff. I know. It could be like a bicentennial man. Like, <laughs> remind me of that. Uh, but, yeah, I, I, I think it's... <laughs> You know, it's so Japan, guys. It's so Japan, and of course it's in Japan. But I love that we are finding new creative ways to put humanoid robots into, you know, features. Like, I think that's really I guess. cool. Would you, would, if, if, let's say Star Trek The Next Generation was coming out today, would you want data played by an actual robot? Not yet, because it seems like it seems like the robots can't really express emotion the way obviously a person can. Well, I mean, the whole point it was with data to couldn't be a robotic, have emotions. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, if it was a really cool robot, I think I might say yes. Sorry, Brent Spiner. <laughs> I feel really bad about that, but I, I don't know about this. I think it's. I think this is a little bit gimmicky and uh, it seems silly. I would love to see the movie and to see how it actually feels. Yeah. Because maybe it maybe it makes maybe sense it, in the context of it all. But see, it seems to me, a little, like the idea, it makes a little sense. Feels, in feels a little premature. I feel premature. like we're we're still so far in the uncanny valley that it doesn't. But you know, it's supposed to look like it's a robot. Supposed and to be, be a, a robot. robot, yeah. See, that's what I'm saying. Like, if it's playing a, ro a robot, playing a robot, like that yeah. seems okay. That seems all right. Yeah. But I mean, what do we think that maybe there are actors already out there that have been replaced with robots? Because honestly, oh, maybe, maybe we are have all been watching movies. Maybe Mark Wahlberg time. has been a robot the entire time. I'm just saying. I mean, listen, guys. Julia Robots. <laughs> Cyborg Bullock. Get out. Julia uh, Roberts. Oh, Julia Roberts. Yeah. Oh, boy. I think on that note, we got to, we got we to, okay, wait. Before we go to break, we are going to go break, though, because I need to laugh Did for I 20, just break 25 the show? minutes. I you broke just broke me. Uh, broke me. Broke me. <laughs> uh, we have to tell you what the hashtag is. So we're doing something new with the hashtag. Instead of hashtag of the day, we're going to do hashtag hey TD. And we want you to use that hashtag for any of the stories you hear during the week. So when you watch the show Monday through Wednesday, the short shows, if there's something you find interesting, you want to comment on it, write us on Twitter and use the hashtag HeyTD and tell us your thoughts about it. And then if we decide that we want to talk about that story on Thursday show, we might use your feedback next yeah, week. So we'd we'll love start to make this a more interactive experience and yes. have you guys commenting and have us reacting to your comments. Yeah. So use the hashtag HeyTD. HeyTD. So uh, we're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we are going to have. Author, television writer, all-around great guy, David Goodman, talked to us about his novel, The Autobiography of James C. Kirk. So don't click away. It's Tomorrow Daily. Welcome back to the show. The gentleman we are about to talk to has a pretty fancy pedigree. He has written in television for 26 years and has written for shows that you love. Uh, Family Guy, Futurama. Star Trek Enterprise. And now uh, he's got his second book out, and we're going to talk to him about it. The book is called The Autobiography of James T. Kirk, which we love. And the author is David Goodman. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited. You are our very first guest on the I, new I, long I, show. I, I think that's somehow sad. <laughs> know. We think it's awesome right. because your book right, sounds super right, awesome. Very good. Well, Maybe right. someone out there is crying. <laughs> They're like, well, this is the worst. How does someone get to write the autobiography of James uh, T. Kirk? I'm going to hold be, up the book. Yeah, not please. be James T. Kirk. Uh, you know, you're uh, a ghost writer. He's a he's a he is a fictional character. Yes, <laughs> that's true. So he did not write the book, but it was um, the idea of the book 
was this idea that he's writing it in his own voice. He's towards the end of his life. He's looking back. And uh, I got to write it. I had written another book, another Star Trek book before. And uh, a friend of mine named Dave Rossi, who, who's worked on a lot of the Star Trek shows as well, uh, it, this was actually his idea. And he thought I would be the right guy to write it. And uh, I was very nervous at the beginning to write it because I can imagine. Star Trek fans are very passionate. And if you get it wrong, they well, don't how do forgive you? Know you. They'll tell you. Yeah. How do you even know if it's wrong? Even if you get it right, they'll tell you it's wrong. So it's, uh, well, I, I am the biggest Star Trek fan. Uh, there's really no way to prove otherwise. Also, but. ladies and gentlemen, we are talking to the world's greatest and biggest Star Wars biggest. fan. Oh, I forgot well, to good. mention that in the honorifics. Star, at the Star Trek. Star Trek, I'm sorry. I don't think I'm the biggest Star Wars. I like Star Wars. Yeah. But not, yeah. Yeah, yeah, Star Trek, my but, bad. But, um, you know, you've, you've wa I've watched all the episodes, I've watched all the movies, and it became a bit of a puzzle, like, what do we know about him, and what needs to be filled in? Yeah. yeah. And it's, uh, there was lots, whole swaths of Kirk's history that had not been written about. Did you get to make it up? I essentially made it up. And how do, how do you get to be <laughs> yeah. able to make it, is there, like, some sort of core group of people that... Maintain yeah, is the there a lore? James T. Kirk or Star Trek Council, like a lore yeah. master? No. Okay. Uh, Would that be you? Maybe that's it, you maybe now. Maybe it's me now. Maybe it's me now with the book. But the um, I'm holding it up again. But the uh, Mike and Denise Okuda. I don't know if you're sure. familiar with their names. They've been involved with Star Trek for a long time, and uh, they wrote a chronology, which ends up being kind of a source for me. Of and in this chronology, they place all the events of Kirk's life that we know from the series. Gotcha. So I know where the gaps are. Yeah. Uh, and then the guy at CBS Consumer Products, I mean John Van Sitter, is a big Star Trek fan. I had to basically clear everything through him. Okay. But I'm as big a fan as he is, so it's not like we had any disagreements. But what about, like, it, can you say something like, Kirk hates sushi? Or I, can you make up little details? Little, like that are, personal details, yeah. yeah. I, I mean, I could. Uh, <laughs> I didn't do that unless I felt it sort of. But would there be somebody something. that would be like, no, 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 he loves sushi? Well, you could say that because I don't think they ever showed him eating sushi. Okay. So if huh. I said it, then. The it, canon would support that. It wouldn't contradict it. Right, it okay, fair enough, fair enough. It. As long as canon doesn't contradict it. Fascinating. Uh, but uh, is it? I think, but, I, I really but, do. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But the, the thing that the, the job of the book was to sort of find things that we haven't said about Kirk but are there anyway. So, for instance, we know Kirk had a son. We find that out in Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan. But if you do the math of how old that son is, looking at the chronology, he was, Kirk was a dad the whole time he was captain of the Enterprise. Which is a big deal. Absentee dad. Absentee uh, dad. Uh. So what does that say about a guy who's like, you know, choosing work over family? So that, five that year becomes... Five-year mission to that, be away from his kid. Five-year, whole career away. He <laughs> yeah, never saw career, the kid. Yeah. So that's a guy making decisions. Uh, the guy never had, never could seem to keep a girlfriend. Uh, now, people might say, oh, he was having fun. But there were all sorts of things in the original series that implied that Kirk was very lonely. Mm -hmm. So well, if he's lonely and he's a good-looking, charming guy, what's, what, the problem? what's the problem? So these were all sort of things that I was kind of playing with yeah. without contradicting things we'd seen already. Is there any That's comedy great. in the book? Is it is it a straight, like, legit autobiography of Kirk? You know, the, it is straight, but like Star Trek, which always had moments of humor, mm -hmm. uh, there's moments of humor. So for... For instance, uh, there's a Star Trek episode where Spock is getting married, and at the end of that episode, uh, Dr. McCoy fakes Kirk's death in front of one of the leaders of Vulcan. And so I, I have a scene later on where this leader of Vulcan basically says, what, what the f***? Can I, can I curse on? No. <laughs> but we'll bleep that. Don't worry. We'll bleep that. That's fine. What's uh, uh, Kirk? This is a what the hell? What the, what the Kirk? Kirk? What the hell? What the Kirk? That what, was the Kirk? The Kirk. what the hell? What the yeah. hell? You said yeah. you, you were dead. What happened? And then she also maybe says he's put on some weight. So <laughs> that there, there are sort of moments. Of, and then the way I deal with some episodes, which I felt were somewhat ridiculous, a reader reading it might see that I have that attitude towards that episode, but I'm not dismissing it at all like right so yeah. uh, so uh in terms of technology i mean obviously you've written for a lot of shows that have right. 
the futuristic technology in them, right. and many of them are very optimistic about the future. So for you, what is the most exciting technology that exists right now? Uh, I, I, I think it's the technology that made that Star Wars robot toy. The BB-8. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah. it's just amazing to me that they made that, that that is a practical effect in the movie, but then also the toy exists. Yeah. How and cool it's right is that? there and we can play that, with it. That's amazing to me. I think that that's sort of a comment on the kind of technology that we sort of take for granted that that can make this completely accurate toy, which if I was a when I was a kid, that toy would be incredibly disappointing. It would be, <laughs> it would have two wheels right. underneath, and, 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 and you wind it up, it. and it yeah. would go like this, yeah. and you know, and and the fact that now kids get to have that toy. So what you're is saying something. is, as the author of <laughs> don't put words in my mouth, what, as the author of the autobiography, <laughs> I think he's about autobiography to do that, of James C. Kirk. Star Wars is more exciting than Star Trek. I, you, you, your words. Oh, not believe I said that at all. <laughs> that was uh, that was like it support. It doesn't contradict the. Uh, it does, it nothing contradict doesn't contradict the, the canon. canon. You know, there is no Star Wars without Star Trek. That's a, yeah, that's George, a really good I've point. I've worked that's with George point. Lucas. He is a big Star Trek fan, and he took lots of things and and also there's lots of parallels between uh, how Star Trek was originally produced. The technology that they had to create to do spaceships week in and week out is very similar to the the technology that Lucas had to create to make Star Wars. It, mm -hmm. They were both groundbreaking properties, and they both created a world that fans love to live in. So there's lots of similarities. And yeah. another similarity is we're getting a new Star Wars, but it sounds like we're getting a, new, getting Star a new Star Trek, Trek TV series. Very yeah. exciting. It, what are you looking forward to for that? What do you hope that it is? I hope it's smart. Uh, I'm very excited because it's clear that CBS sees this as something they want to be big and mm -hmm. succeed, and 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 so it'll be, it'll be big. Uh, to me, Star Trek is always about the writing, yeah. and the Star Trek shows that I have loved are written by people who are much smarter than me. Right. So I hope they find somebody much smarter than me who writes this show uh, well. Uh, that's about all. Do you think? Um if, but if even, you, if it's, even if it's terrible, I'm going to watch. So it yeah, yeah. Of course, yeah, no, we will too. If, if hypothetically speaking, let's say like someday you become the showrunner of this new Star Trek universe, mm -hmm. like, or if we just get, if they just said, okay, they call you tomorrow and they say whatever you want to make it, would you make it uh, something, or would you prefer to see something that already exists in Star Star Trek canon, or would you rather uh, see something brand new, like a new crew on a new ship? I think it's new crew, new ship. I think that you, oh, I, I think you set it further in the future. I think Star Trek always, to me, is always about the time in which it was made. Mm -hmm. yeah. So they're sure. they're always commenting on things that are happening right now, and to me, you want that show to feel like it's ha it's in a different era, it's in our new era, and it's reflecting. Uh, Politics, who social mores, who we are. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, I think that's, that's cool. the strength of science fiction in general, but specifically Star Trek. Right. For sure. Well, also, you know, I think that that's the the thing that Roddenberry did so well. This template that he created to do a show that could be this action adventure thing, but also have social commentary. I mean, yeah. that that if you look back in 1966 and what was on television at that time. It's an amazing accomplishment. Completely different, yeah. yeah. This, that was the time of uh, of all of the Western. the Dukes, yeah, the Dukes of Hazard. Or had, even before this, so it's like Western. TV, Green Gables. Uh, I think Man from Uncle. Man or from Uncle. Lots of westerns, Bonanza, Gunsmoke. Yeah. So yeah, to before take you it guys into were outer born, space. I have a feeling, oh right? yeah, it was definitely me. Yeah, I was, <laughs> well, I'm not born then. Uh, so so uh, what what are some of the adventures that Kurt gets into in the book? Is it stuff from the series and beyond? Uh, I'm filling in his life, so I'm sort of showing how he becomes the captain we know. So life on the farm, when he was born in Iowa, life on the farm, who his parents were, his connection to Starfleet, uh, uh, and then how he gets into Starfleet Academy. I just I want to show you guys yeah. really quick, if we take this, that there are some great pictures in here. I love that they're actual. Uh, yeah. There's yeah. some amazing photos of, you know, when he graduates the Academy, and oh, here's him. <laughs> him and Spock together. It's pretty great. Uh, you should. Th there's so much great stuff in here. I really, yeah. I really uh, enjoy it. And so it's really his adventures leading up to th the adventures that we know, mm -hmm. uh, how he becomes the starship captain that we're familiar with, and then trying to find ways to talk about the adventures we're familiar with in a new way. Uh, whenever I'm summarizing events that we're familiar with, I'm injecting a new perspective or something, some detail that connects to something else later on or earlier on in his life. And then um, really uh, just trying to create 
a story of a guy uh, who becomes this hero but is also uh, tragic in some ways as mm -hmm. well. Is never really fully happy, uh, yet makes a difference in his world. So very last question. Uh, when can Jeff and I buy tickets to see the Oscar-winning biopic in theaters? <laughs> yeah. yeah, there you go. Well, that's going to be up to you guys. That seems <laughs> ripe for a You're biopic. You're going to have to get this made. And I'm yeah. leaving this on your uh, You know, I will. Plate. Jeff and I are going to start a production company right now. I love now. it. Get going. Uh, all right, so guys, the book is The Autobiography of James T. Kirk. Uh, here it is. I'll show, oh, yeah, we'll show, show it to you, we'll... show you this lovely cover right here. The Autobiography of James T. Kirk. You don't want to miss it, if you, especially if you're a Trek fan. But even if you're not a Trek fan, get into it because there's going to be a new Star Trek soon, and you're going to want to know all about James T. Kirk's one, the OG captain of the Enterprise. <laughs> the OG. Right. OG captain of the Enterprise. O OG. OG. Oh, I guess the OC, original captain. He was original. the original gangster. He was original gangster. See, I don't know all those young yeah. terms. I'm that's sorry. Right. The youth, <laughs> not, us youth. Actually, that term sorry. isn't very young anymore. No, it's uh, not. No, we're that's old. We're old, too. That's much <laughs> older. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for being thank here. You well, so well, thank you so much for having me. This was so much fun. David A. Goodman, if you want to look him up online. And thank you so much. And hopefully we will have you back when you write your next book. I I would love to write another book and come back. The Spock. We'll see that one. Well, fingers crossed. I'm, I'm into that. All right. <laughs> That's a much we'll drier book. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, very dry. Yeah. All right, guys, we will be right back. We're going to take a quick break, and then we're going to talk about some BlizzCon 2015. So don't click away. It's Tomorrow Daily. <laughs> Uh, that was a delightful interview. It was delightful. He was great. And speaking of stuff that's great, we were down in Anaheim this weekend checking out BlizzCon 2015, specifically looking at the eSports phenomenon. Check it out. If you haven't been paying attention, eSports is a huge industry. Some analysts are predicting it will net over $600 million worldwide in 2015, and it's only growing. At this year's BlizzCon, Blizzard's annual fan convention, eSports proved to be one of the show's biggest draws. The Olympic Games of eSports is happening here. Four World Championships at BlizzCon. Four, and it's super exciting. Everybody here is really, really thrilled to check this out and see who the champions are going to be. Most game studios involved in esports have a single game in competition. As we mentioned, Blizzard has four. StarCraft II, the uber-popular real-time strategy game that pits Terrans, Protoss, and Zerg against one another in a military sci-fi epic. Mega MMO World of Warcraft's Arena Championships, featuring PvP teams duking it out for glory. Blizzard's newest game, Heroes of the Storm, a free-to-play multiplayer online battle arena starring playable characters from every game in the company's arsenal and Hearthstone, the collectible card game for PC, smartphones, and tablets that lets players build custom decks and face off against local or online opponents. There are four very different types of games, and even though every game's dev team knows the ins and outs of each one, esports players always make it interesting. I think they always surprise us. They are always doing things at a level of play that is so far beyond what any of us are capable of. Who's going to deal all the damage for Cloud9? Who's going to carry the it's good! All those people cheering, they're cheering for a game that just came out in June. StarCraft II has a long-standing, even bigger fan base with even more intense fans. It's so exciting and it's amazing to be able to watch that, especially in person and see your favorite person. I'm still trying to get Life's uh, autograph. Favorite players and teams are a staple in the esports community, just like traditional sports. Blizzard is well aware of that fact, and when its developers work on games with potential esports components, they definitely like to keep players and spectators in mind. Those values that we kind of instilled to make the play experience better for the player hopefully will um, be valuable for someone who's watching the game. And speaking of valuable, those winners aren't just walking away with pride. The prize pool across all four championship series at BlizzCon 2015 was $1.25 million. We are in the wrong business and need to get better at video games. It's obvious that esports is huge, even if you've never seen a match. Yeah, the whole convention is built on passion, passionate fans, passionate creators, and esports themselves, I think, just builds that passion and builds on that passion. Esports is only going to get bigger from here. It's true. And, you know, who knows? Maybe we'll see one of you here playing for the World Championships next year. Uh, BlizzCon was so good. That yeah. moment, that moment where 
the player from Cloud Nine picks Murky, the whole crowd just went ballistic. It was such a yeah. You moment. see it in the in the package we just showed that moment. It, it, they <laughs> their team composition was so bizarre. They had one warrior who's kind of the tank. They had two healers and two specialists, Murky and Abathur. Bizarre team comp, no assassins in the team, and yet they made it work. They won the game. It's that kind of thing, I think, that makes this an exciting spectator sport. Yeah, I mean, it's. it was funny. I was watching some of the stuff I missed at BlizzCon. I was actually like watching it on my TV last night. I would pull up on YouTube and checking yeah. it out, and I turned to my husband, and I was like, is this who I am now? Like, I'm a sports fanatic. I'm an eSports yeah. fanatic now. Like, I'm like, honey, the game's on. I'm watching Heroes of the Storm. Yeah. Shush. Like it, <laughs> that's what it felt like last night. It was amazing. It's pretty cool. I've become so addicted to, to Heroes of the Storm. But, you know, people have the same feelings about League of Legends and Dota. And MOBAs in particular are, are capturing this feeling. Yeah. But I think also it's, it's manifesting in stuff like Games Done Quick. Yeah. Where you see these guys who do speed runs, who trick the game into doing things it wasn't intended to do. The idea of watching someone else play a game at a high skill level, I think, is so... It's catching on, it's and really it's compelling. so compelling. Yeah. yeah, it's compelling. You want to see it. Because if you're any kind of gamer, regardless of where you're casual or really into gaming, like, to see people play at that level is really impressive. Like, even, I mean, I play a lot of video games, but I to watch somebody play something, for, Splatoon is a great example. So I play a lot of Splatoon. We know this. To see <laughs> people play at really high levels is so impressive to yeah. me. And sometimes we come up against these people with, you know, with a specific weapon where they're using it in a way that I'm just like, oh my, I can't get around this guy. Like, yeah. I, I I don't know how he's doing it. And I wish I could rewatch those. I, I, like, just as my own, for my own value. Yeah. But so it, it really speaks to the, you know, the value again of, of spectator for uh, for all of these games. It's I mean, really I, the only thing I can equate it to is playing pickup basketball and then going home and watching the NBA. You know, yeah. it, it really is that same experience. Yeah. And I think that for this entire generation, we're going to grow up and that's just going to be normal and it's just only going to get bigger and more televised and more prominent. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah. And BlizzCon in general was just so much fun. There was the costumes, you guys. <laughs> yeah. Amazing. Uh, and then, of course, you know, they have all of the games. We got to play some Overwatch. Like, we play a lot of that. Yeah. Uh, it was great. It, we had a, such a good time and, uh, and we highly recommend you check out some esports whatever game it is yeah. um but we we specifically we were at blizzcon and they happen to have four championships so we checked those out but um but yeah it's definitely worth your time to uh to just watch a match see if you're see if you like it because I, I feel like some of you will really enjoy it and speaking of stuff we enjoy uh, i think it's time to talk about into it <laughs> All right, so I'll let you go first. It's your first time on the, the long show. So Thank you. So please tell me what you are into this week. I can't wait. Well, uh, I think you know this about me. I am a gigantic hobby board game player. The, I, I slightly knew this. The designer board game movement, the European style board games. Uh, if you think board games are just Monopoly and Parcheesi and, and Clue, uh, there's an entire giant, giant massive cool industry happening. And, and my Intuit is, uh, is a board game that I kickstarted that I got recently, and uh, it, it's now available. Anybody can buy it. It's called Steampunk Rally. Okay. I think this is right up your alley. and my, that my is Steampunk Rally? Yeah. All so right. you play as one of the great scientists of history, and the only way these scientists can decide whether or not they, who's the best scientist, you got Einstein and Tesla and Madame Curie and all these, uh, the only way they can decide who's the best is that they get together and have a race on machines that they built. And it's this cool, like, steampunk giant machines. So as you play, you select one of those scientists and you start constructing this machine in front of you and you try to race around this desert environment. I already like this. It's incredible. So you're 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 literally drafting cards and placing them down in front of you and you have to fit them together to make this machine work and then you roll dice and assign the dice to certain parts of the machine that make it do certain other things to create more dice, to be able to roll those, to then propel your machine through the race. So you're really trying to build this like perpetual motion machine with all the different parts that it's making and, and the dice that you're rolling. It is extremely fun. My wife really dug it. Uh, I, I It's one of my favorite games that I've gotten recently. And uh, it's it's about forty bucks. You can buy it now. Okay. Uh, I I really really like it. I this is you're a huge nerd. Like I'm. I'm a I'm, huge nerd. I'm finding this out today. Like, oh, is there I, any doubt? I, I thought that's how I got the job. Like I kind of knew, <laughs> but I didn't know the depths. The depths of the nerditude. 
Is yeah. it nerditude? Nerdtosity. You Nerd, know, whatever. Nerdosity? Nerd, uh, yeah. We'll take it. Uh, but yeah, no, this is great. This looks really fun. I feel like I want to try it. It's cool because it, it can play from two to eight players, and there's very few games nowadays that can play up to eight, which it's is like really cool. It's like two to four or four to eight. Like there's yeah, usually it, it, eight's all, good it range. is a lot of number of you know, people. And, and if yeah. you have a big party, you can still play this game, and it doesn't slow it down because you're all drafting at the same time. Um, yeah, and, and board games are great. If you know, I, I love video games, but there's nothing like sitting across the table and being social with someone, having drinks, having some food, and playing a physical thing. I love I like board it. games, so no, check I... out Steampunk Rally. Steampunk Rally. Okay, yeah. cool. All right. Well, I have something completely different that I'm into, but <laughs> okay. it's really, really fun, and it's super weird, you guys. Of course it is. Uh, in 1977, this guy, his name is Peter Stoney uh, M. Schwiller. M. Schwiller is his last name. Uh, he interviewed himself in 1977 using, at the time, uh, state-of-the-art equipment, and he's calling it later that same life. Okay, so here he is. That's him. That's good old Stoney. Yeah. He's 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 18 years old in this in this shot. This is in 77. He put together the sizzle reel, and he went to crowdfunding and said, "Hey, listen, like." When I was 18, I filmed myself asking myself a whole bunch of questions about my life, like how my life turned out. Like, well, who did you marry? You look really, like, just inter basically totally going host on himself and interviewing him. But he about also, his like, future. filmed, like, fake answers, like, uh huh. And, oh, oh, oh my goodness. Yeah, yeah, he filmed responses and he was like, he was like, oh, oh, that's, that's really disappointing. Like, it's yeah. upsetting. He basically gave himself a toolkit for later in life. To fill out a... To fill in this, yeah. like, kind of a video journal of his life. It's really impressive. It's sort of like, you know, those journals where you fill out, like, questions and you answer them and then you yeah. go back three years later and you answer them again? Kind of like that, but instead of a couple years, uh, 30, 38 years. Well, so, that's what's so crazy to me about this this story is that if I had done that in my, what, early 20s or, you know, late teens and he's in, in this video... I would have done this way sooner. He waits till he's like fifty something years old. Well, I think he said um, in the in the uh, the crowdfund website he had said he had like a, a minor health scare and it made oh. him realize like oh I I should do this like I really should absolutely do this. So he went to crowdfunding. He asked for ten thousand dollars. Right now there's six days left. He has twenty two thousand dollars. People really like the idea. Um, if he gets to twenty five thousand, which I really hope he does. Uh, he is going to digitally remaster the old footage. <laughs> he is going to rent a professional black, uh, like a cube, to like a soundproof black cube to film his responses in. Um, he used to make films when he was a kid, so it's some Star Trek. It's, Star it's Trek great because he, he did a little bit of it that you see in the crowdfunding video. Yeah. And it is, I'm fascinated by time and, yeah. and, and the ravages of time. It's and amazing. You, and you see, it really draws into stark contrast, like, how we change as people, and it, yeah. it's a kind of a beautiful thing. He asks him like, "How did you meet your your spouse?" And like, I was yeah. like, "I mean, it's great. It's really, really great. It's hilarious. It looks really interesting, and also very poignant. Like, I think, like you said, there's some there's some really deep kind of ideas here. Uh, but he's here in Los Angeles, so I feel like we should oh, try we should to get a get hold him. of him and yeah. bring him on the show. So. How do you have the forethought to do this when you're young? I wish I, I had know. I had had that kind of forethought because you don't. I don't think about myself. Old I when vote. I'm in my we, teens. Let's track him down. Let's interview him and get some answers. Let's see if he can figure out a way to interview me when I was a kid. Maybe as a time machine. That would be great. <laughs> That'd be awesome. Uh, all right, guys, it's time for our very last thing in the show, which is always our phone photographer of the day. Our phone photographer of the day today is Gerald. Gerald took this ridiculously amazing picture I on, want to go to there on his iPhone 5s and wrote us an email and he says this is a photo I took on my iPhone 5s in May 2015 it's at Kayangan Lake Koran Palawan Philippines I took it while on a 20-day vacation in Philippines in Philippines and Singapore which we are super jealous of yeah look at that the Sun was bright and the water so clear it is unedited and straight from my phone I thought it was a beautiful and surreal photo of paradise on earth you have my permission to use it if you'd like P.S. Love the show. Keep up the good work. Thank you. Uh, well, Gerald, uh, we are super jealous that yeah. you went on that vacation. Also, I agree with Jeff. I want to go to there <laughs> and never come back. 
Yeah, what a what a gorgeous spot. And the water is so clear looking. Oh, my goodness. I literally everybody who sends in pictures, I think to myself like, all right, well, I'm just going to add that to the places I will probably never get to in my life, but yeah. like to visit. Uh, I just write that down and then I kind of just sadly stare at your pictures and go, I I hopefully <laughs> I'm never going to go there. It's really sad. Uh, yeah, super amazing, Gerald. Really great job. Uh, if you guys want to submit your photography, you can email us tomorrow at cnet.com. That is uh, that is our email address. If you want to send us uh, segment ideas? Yeah. What is it? I, we love your feedback, really. And also, please tell us what you took the photo on and give us permission to use it in the show. Yeah, we always love that. Uh, if you guys want to find us on social media, it's really, really easy. We're just Tomorrow Daily on Facebook, Twitter. Uh, if you want to share the show with a friend. Oh, we'd appreciate that for we sure. We really like that. Uh, it, we will have Genghis call you and tell you thank you. Uh, he can figure right? out your... Well, I don't know. At some point, <laughs> Genghis is going to have an algorithm more. that can figure out your phone number, <laughs> but we don't know when that'll be. It's more functionality than I anticipated. <laughs> it's a secret. Uh, so, uh, yeah, no, please share the show. Uh, it's TomorrowDaily.com. Super easy to uh, to give the show to somebody. To give the gift of Tomorrow Daily to somebody. I'd love to hear pe- what people's reaction to our, our new long show. This is the first please. one, and we're still going to continue to evolve the idea and, and take your advice and, and suggestions into consideration. So, please don't don't hesitate to share those things with us. Yes, please. Um, and 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 if there are bad comments or, or like negative feedback, please write us an, a letter, like with your hands, <laughs> and think really hard, and maybe the address will show up in your brain. And then if it does, send it to us. That's where that's how to give us we negative can, feedback. We can take negative. No, we can feedback. handle it. It'll be fine. You're all right. If you guys want to find us online, I am on Twitter at Ashley Escada. I'm at Jeff Canada. And you can find producer Logan at Logan Moy if you'd like to go har- harass him, uh, which he likes. You should definitely go talk to him on Twitter. Uh, and that's it for the show. Uh, we will be back on Monday with a short episode. Yeah. One of us will be hosting it. Who knows? Tune in to find out who. And uh, we're not having a long episode next week, right? Uh, we are. Actually, you know what? I lied. We do not have any shows next week because I'm going to be in San Francisco. <laughs> so this Sorry. is a one-off. So it gives you plenty of time to decide how you feel about this episode. Yeah. Maybe watch it a few times. Watch this send us week's some... <laughs> show. Just all four episodes back-to-back yeah. back, a lot next week. And then think about it. And send us some, send us some feedback. And so we, we can build on this as we move into December. Right. We're going to have short episodes the week of Thanksgiving. But we will not have a long show. Obviously, Thanksgiving is on a Thursday. Um, but, so we'll be back the first week of December. So we apologize for the interruption in programming. Uh, we just really wanted to get this going. We didn't want to wait till December. Uh, so that's it for the show today. Please find us online. Let us know what you think. Uh, Thank you for listening and watching, and we will see you guys next time. But until then, be good humans. Bye.